Hey, Jamel, how you doing? Hey, what's going on, everyone? How are y'all? Good. Jamel, do you eat snow? You know what? I did one time when I was drunk. The first time I ever had. <laughs> it's true. The first. The, That's perfect. Yeah, the, the, the first time I ever had tequila, me and two of my college friends, we split a bottle and I ate the worm. And um, I ran and dove on top of a snowy car and ate the snow partially off the car. Good times. Jamel's got some great drunk stories. It's time for your friendly neighborhood race lady. Uh, it is nice to see you. The reason we're having you on is not to tell drunk stories, although I want some. Uh, can you give me some more? Because uh, we've talked uh, we've talked about some of these before. If you've got a if you've got a better one you'd like to show off, we we'd love to have it. Well, I was just asked if I ever ate snow. And one time in college, I was super drunk. I, it was the first time I ever had tequila, Jose Cuervo. And to this day, I do not drink Cuervo. Um, I do drink tequila, just not Cuervo. And me and two other of my friends, we, we went through a whole fifth of tequila. I was the one who swallowed the worm. And I decided it was a good idea to run out of the house party we were in and dive headfirst on top of a car. And I started eating snow. I also thought my stereo was trying to attack me later on when I was in my bed. So, and I, so I was fighting the air. So it is very true that the worm is a hallucinogen. Um, I'm just here to testify. <laughs> Jamel, did you, I ate snow as a kid. Did, was that the first time you'd eaten snow? Yeah, it was. It was okay. the first time I ever ate snow. I was uh, about 20 years old and drunk. Uh, yeah, underage drinking is bad, I guess. So I was just a weird <laughs> so, little kid. Good, good, good. So maybe yeah, sir, yes, you. Char. <laughs> what's the wait what's the maple syrup thing ah uh, yeah tell her i i would put maple syrup on snow and eat it pretty straightforward why <laughs> it's just the way it, it was delicious because everybody. it was yummy it was jamel she's from maine oh. sounds good <laughs> okay she's from maine that makes sense that makes more sense okay i got it now now i got it i'm not a big sauce person like i'm one of the few people like I don't love syrup. I don't like uh, my my husband thinks I'm completely bizarre because I don't I don't really love ketchup or like most sauces in general. I don't necessarily love. I am uh, glad that you brought up your husband because the reason I wanted to talk to you is this is unusual. Jamel uh, is a she's associated and affiliated with Detroit in a lot of ways. Cares about Detroit, but is not a Lions fan. Uh, she's a 49er fan, and her husband is a rabid uh, Lions fan. So please explain to me what's been happening this week because it seems uh, it seems unpleasant to to have this in your home this week. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that movie, uh, War of the Roses, starring Michael uh, Douglas and Kathleen Turner, but that's basically been my house, um, you know, the part of this week. Uh, once the Lions clinched uh, and made it, you know, as official, they were going to be in the NFC Championship game. My husband then took my 49ers jersey, which would be a Debo Samuel jersey, and it's right over there. That's why I look that way. A Debo Samuel jersey and a Jimmy Garoppolo jersey, and he um, put them in the trash. And he made a whole video about it, about doing it. And uh, he has been, it's like he had the trash talking saved in drafts. So like, you know, he um, he was at work yesterday. He called me and um, yes, people, he does like to be shirtless quite a bit. I mean, he's got a good body. I don't blame him, right? Um, at any rate, so he has been trash talking me nonstop since this has happened and a lot of people have been asking me are you going to switch over are you going to root for the lions i'm like no i've i've never been a lions fan i've been rooting for the 49ers for 40 years okay it's like it would feel very disingenuous to switch but i do wonder if my marriage will be the same after this week because he has promised more torture uh currently he is away for work and i have some plans of my own he's probably going to come home and find all his lion stuff burned in our front yard but that's a story for Wait, another I be, time. So I, I, I believe her, but let's play that video for uh, the audience. You've played it there. So you did you fish this out of the garbage can? Did you fish the... Uh, I, I, I prevented him from putting it deeper down in there. It was like at the top because it still had hangers on it. And I had to sort of take it out of his hands so that it would not be totally embroiled in you know, food or whatnot. What, but was he trying to, this is not performative. He is trying to make your life unpleasant and have you discard, uh, you know, jerseys that have value to you. 
Um, well, no. I mean, I think one of them's a just, Garoppolo. Just, <laughs> okay, which he likes to tease me about. He when I when I got the jersey, he was like, "You know that's stupid, right? Because this there's no way that he's ever going to lead you all to a Super Bowl or or not lead us to a Super Bowl like that we would win a Super Bowl with him." And uh, but this is what I told him. I was like, "If you have led the 49ers to a Super Bowl, I I have your jersey." So I have a Kaepernick jersey, I have a Garoppolo jersey. I um I lost my I actually lost my Joe Montana and Steve Young jerseys. I don't know where they are. So that is my criteria. You take us to a Super Bowl, I'm going to buy your jersey. Uh, you should you should ask your husband where they are, Jamel. Feels like there's a culprit. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I didn't even think about that. But you're right. Just saying. I might have to do some investigating uh, while he's while he's gone. But, uh, yes, yeah, so a lot of trash talking. Um, he's left me some messages on his whiteboard about the 49ers. <laughs> he, is, he is not letting up, which is why – he better pray the Lions win this game because I am unleashing hell on him. And we've already made a bet for the game that will be unpleasant for us both if either loses. And we'll just see. I mean, we'll probably wind up having to go to marriage counseling after this. So we'll just see. Any particulars on the bet you wish to share publicly or is this uh, this is all private information? No, because it'll be out on social media, I'm sure, soon when we disclose the terms of the bet. But basically... Um, we both are going to write a letter that the other one has to read on and and um, broadcast on all our social channels. And I only I can only imagine what he's thinking of having me read before the world about his team. I'm sure it'll be like a bunch of expletives about how terrible the 49ers is. I'm a traitor. I'm sure it'll be some of these. But as I have to remind him, I'm the writer of the family. So that's what I was going to say. You better... you're, you're the favorite and the writer. You've got the game at home and you're the writer. Uh, and correct. He's got 50 years of losing behind him that shouldn't make him a big mouth in this situation. But, you know, to be honest, like this is going to be a tough game. Like I, I've never said that this is going to be some kind of cakewalk. And I realize the Lions history is, is certainly some part of this. But the, the reality is that. You know, Detroit has an explosive offense. Like, they're a good team. They got here for a reason. Now, and I know some people look at how we played against Green Bay and are thinking this team doesn't – they didn't play well. They don't look right. Maybe they're not in the right mi uh, mind frame for this game. But, you know, the Packers were a team that beat the Lions this year too. And that, that team, put it like this, would I rather the 49ers have the, the Packers or who the Lions had with the Bucks? I would have much rather had the Bucks than have the Packers because they really seem like a team that is truly on the rise and going to be a problem in that division going forward. But, you know, the 49ers are going to have to play well, but I like how they match up defensively against Detroit. I do think if it comes down to which defense can get a stop at the necessary time, I think it'll be San Francisco and not Detroit. I do think the six and a half uh, point favorite thing is really interesting because I think this game is going to be closer than that. This feels like a field goal type of game. Up dispassionately, though, if you can. If you look at this dispassionately, America's rooting for Detroit, right? I mean, they're the feel-good story. They're the underdog. They're everything, right? I mean, that, that's, what, that's yes. what the husband has over you. He does. I mean, he's got the emotional triggers. And, you know, look, this is San Francisco trying to win its sixth Super Bowl, something the Lions – that has never been a reality for the Lions in the modern Super Bowl era. They're one of – the small group of teams that have never won a Super Bowl in this modern era. And considering that a lot of people look at Detroit a certain way as a downtrodden city, even though I, the one thing I'm not looking forward to if the Lions win is all these very lazy narratives that are about to come out about Detroit, that the Lions success has contributed to the revitalization. And I'm like, no, that, that revitalization started a long time ago. Downtown Detroit got a Gucci store. OK, we've been revitalized. All right. So, you know, I know that that's like a very easy narrative to be like, look at this downtrodden, beaten city. Like everybody is walking around there um, in tattered pants and whatnot. It's like it's it's not really that city anymore. Like any city, it has its bad neighborhoods. And I think for a long time, Detroit in general suffered from not having the best national reputation. This is an opportunity for people to see our city a lot differently. And so I realized that the emotional narratives are completely on his side. Like nobody wants to root for big business to win. And the 49ers have been there winning championships is part of the DNA and the Lions don't have one. And so naturally everybody, of course, is going to gravitate toward Detroit. 
and look, in many ways, it's a win-win for me. If San Francisco advances, I will be extremely happy. Detroit advances, I will also be happy because I know what that means for the city and for the fans like my husband, however annoying he's going to be this week. But let's uh, talk about that for a second because when we talk about regional pride and what sports does to a neighborhood's identity, uh, Detroit, as you speak of it, has had the reputation that downtown has uh, felt unpleasant. But didn't sports revitalize that isn't sports the reason that downtown is now vibrant in Detroit because it wasn't uh, the silver dome anymore but because they they built out economies around around stadiums um yes I mean now all of Detroit's teams are downtown but that wasn't the only thing Dan because realize that it's been a while since any of those teams have been successful I mean the Pistons you see what they look like right now and they I mean, I forget how long it's going on now since since they've made the playoffs. Um, and this is the 20 year anniversary uh, of them winning the NBA finals, which obviously last happened in, in 2004. Uh, the Tigers have not been great, but I think having the teams downtown was just another step. But beyond that, there was a lot that was going on uh, because, you know, people maybe who haven't been to Detroit don't realize that is that this is, this is an enormous waterfront off Detroit. You can see Canada from Detroit. You know, Windsor is our neighbor. And so that waterfront drew a lot of big business and a lot of people were very interested in seeing this city be revitalized because economically what it could do for the whole state. I mean, this summer, uh, it used to be that you could stay downtown easily. Uh, maybe like 10 years ago, you could stay downtown in a hotel for less than probably $130. Easy. You could find a nice hotel. Now, good luck finding anything under 300 um, it has, and, and certainly the Lions' success this season has been a part of that because these weekends are booked out. But the the concerts, the the other entertainment that Detroit tends to draw, has all been a part of this overall revitalization. I mean, Detroit has one of the most happening restaurant scenes in the country. The you know pre COVID, the number of new restaurants that have been created in in Detroit, it's been astounding. So there's this revolution started maybe at best in conjunction with the the sports teams now all being located in, in one place, but it's been underway now for a while. So this idea that the Lions, you know, being successful now, that's what, you know, Gucci stores just don't pop up overnight. <laughs> okay. Like to, the fact that Detroit has major department stores, Under Armour, Nike, all these places now downtown, like that was kind of in process for a few years. That was your friendly neighborhood race lady. It's going to be bad on Sunday, Jamel. Around your television, in your household, it's going to be bad, right? What's it going to look like? It's it's going to be bad. Well, uh, we're trying to figure out if we're going to be able to watch the game together, um, number one. I think we will because, again, he has some work obligations that have taken him out of town. So he's trying to get back here, and, and we'll see. Because um, he also has the option of maybe going to Detroit to watch with his fellow Lions fans. But I'm a little scared, Dan. I, I, I got to be perfectly honest. I don't know if it's a good idea that we watch it's this not, game together. It's, it's not. It's not a good idea. We'll talk to you on Monday when you're divorced. Okay. Talk to you later, right. Goodbye. I've been waiting for Charlotte to come in here because I needed to talk to someone who also grew up in a cold climate about this trend I keep seeing. Um, people are eating snow off the ground, putting it, like, in a blender with, like, sweet and condensed milk and like vanilla and sugar and then like refreezing it and eating it like ice cream. I think that is so gross, but apparently this is a thing that a ton of people do. And I mentioned it to Chris Cody the other day and he's like, I don't know. Why would that be gross? Is that like, what's, what is that about? And I needed to talk to Charlotte because you what? grew up somewhere where it, it snowed a lot. Is this not disgusting? Okay. I have a lot of thoughts on the snow cream thing, Jess. I'm thrilled you waited for me. Grew up in a very cold place. A lot of experience with snow. I used to do this with maple syrup. I would go outside and I would drizzle maple syrup on the snow and it would sort <laughs> no, of No, Charlotte, stop. We'll just no, wait. let her cook. Just let her cook. You took the maple syrup outside? Yeah. And I would pour it on the snow and I would let it freeze and then I would eat the maple syrup and it was a fun little treat as a kid. I never went as far as to bring the snow inside, mix it with stuff, put it in a blender, refreeze it. That to me is a new level of gross because you're just putting something for it's like collecting rainwater. It's dirty water. It's like the difference between going outside and like going eh, when it rains and then putting collecting 
the rain to free. Yeah, we've all done that. Well put. I used to try to catch rain. Right. But so I, I think so I think it's gross to do it in that quantity. I think a little bit of maple syrup on that's a snowy no, rock. Charlotte, that's weird. Also, the most like that's main also thing so you've ever weird. said. I was is, is it is the thought process that the freezing of like putting it bringing it back in and freezing it gets rid of all whatever dirt is in no, the snow? The, like the, to me, the thought pro- no. I think they're just like blending it with like sugar and stuff, and then like making it into notice. a better consistency. To me, I, so I had a really traumatizing incident when I was little shoveling snow once. That let's talk about it. All right, I will. We'll, we'll talk about it. Um, I feel like that's what she was. Yeah, gonna I was do about to do that. I just want her to feel comfortable. Uh, not as traumatizing as seeing Poppy's earwax, but <laughs> I also am very rattled right now. Um, so this has kind of shaped my opinion about eating snow, because like, mm-hmm. I, yeah, catching snowflakes on your tongue, I, everyone does that. That's you know, you you just do that. But eating it in large quantities grosses me out because to me, the snow's not clean. So one time when I was seven or eight, mm-hmm. I was helping my dad shovel, and I was in the front yard. And the snow on my front yard looked like it was untouched. It looked <gasps> perfect. It was just beautiful, beautiful, fluffy white snow, a couple feet of it. Couldn't see the grass. It was a lot of snow. And I was, you know, helping my dad shovel and then playing in the snow and then whatever. So I remember vividly putting my hand like into a fresh pile of snow mm-hmm. on the front lawn Uh-oh. and just kind of like, you know, feeling, making some snowballs. And I felt something hard. Oh, no. And I grabbed it and picked it up and I stared at it for a second. And in my, in my head, I thought, how did one of my dog's toys get outside buried in the snow? And then I realized it was a squirrel no. that was frozen solid in the snow. Oh. And I was holding a squirrel, oh. petrified solid. And I took it and I threw it like Joe Milton throwing an orange. Like it, <laughs> it ended up in the neighbor's house a mile away. It was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life. And from that moment forward... Never, ever, ever picked up snow and eaten it. And so when I see people doing this, like, it triggers me looking at that gross, dead, petrified squirrel and thinking, ugh, they don't know, but there could be a squirrel in there. The way that you describe it, though, I think most people would say if I put these ingredients in a cup that they're making this snow cream with and don't put the snow, it would be delicious. Like, anything would be delicious with maple syrup. Anything would be delicious with these ingredients that we're talking about. If you also make it snow, you're just doing frozen icy stuff, but it's dirty water. Yes, there, there is some. That is one of the grossest things. Uh, we're having a gross day here. We went from earwax no, to. No, Charlotte, what to, you do is way weirder. I'm not going to lie. You bring oh, maple weird. syrup outside? Yeah, you bring it outside. You drizzle it on a rock. Don't it syrup hardens. shame it's her. It's like a fun little game to play as a kid. You eat it. It's like, mmm, this is different and it's exciting because it's snow, but you don't eat too much of it. And you do it on. You do it where there are no dead squirrels. We have frozen well, iguanas know. down here. Yeah. Like, is, is, are you sure that squirrel, like, up there, I assume the snow, that's actually dead, that squirrel, no, right? Because down here, was. when it gets 40 <laughs> degrees down here, the iguanas freeze, no, that's a cold, and then they unfreeze, cold, and they're alive again. Cold, that thing was cold. dead, let it's me cold. tell you. It's it was... get reanimated. As soon as you threw it into your neighbor's yard, it reanimated How itself. can we talk to animal experts this much, and you think an iguana has the same sort of blood and reacts to freezing? Oh, I'm dead. I know every animal's blood. Good impression. That is that that is. That's great. going in the that, suey's that, for the, sure. The impression, <laughs> the impression that starts with "Oh, I'm Dan" and gives the name to everybody, and, <laughs> and then makes me so arrogant that I know everyone's blood. Yes, uh, the iguana freezes and it doesn't actually die, but when the squirrel is frozen, it's dead. It's not the good prote- to know. It's. The- <laughs> I mean, it was dead. I guess my point is, like, no matter how fresh and clean and fluffy and white the snow looks, you never know what's lurking underneath. And, like, I've seen people scoop up the snow off their car. I'm like, ugh, I don't, I, I don't, I don't approve of that. That grosses me out. I, uh, I do want a T-shirt that's that arrogant. I'm Dan, and I know everyone's blood <laughs> is, yeah. is, is is what every animal. Yeah, blood. yeah, okay. that's an important. Don't, no, qualifier. don't don't limit it to just animals. It's everything. Everything's blood. I know far more than that. Uh, Jessica, it's not the only reason, though, that Charlotte has been waited for around here. Jessica Jessica has been wanting to talk for two weeks about a poltergeist with just you for some reason. She hasn't wanted to discuss it with us. Only you she wants to discuss it with. Okay, well, you're really hyping this up, Dan. I read read an article that Andrew Lloyd Webber 
said that at one point in his life, he had a poltergeist in his home in London and he called an exorcist and they exorcised the poltergeist and it left. And I really wanted to talk about it. And for weeks, everyone was like just staring at me like we have, we don't want to talk about Andrew Lloyd Webber or, or poltergeist. And I was like, you know who will? Charlotte Wilder. Yeah, 1000% she wants to talk about this. Big into musicals and the people who wrote them. Big into ghosts. Big into poltergeist. You know, this get. Now do we understand why you wrote the Phantom of the Opera? Yeah. That was my exact thought. I was like, wow, is that the is that what inspired him? He had his own personal phantom in his home? Phantom of the Opera was a documentary, folks. He was he had a horny poltergeist. <laughs> One of the things that was Phantom uh, was very horny, Dan. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate it. I didn't realize it until I was in my twenties. I went and saw it yeah. and I was like, Oh, the Phantom just wants to have sex. Yeah, like yeah. he just has been in the no, bottom of the opera but when i was younger i didn't really read it that way and then as an older woman i was like it's a little creepy and then he kidnaps her and wants to like be with her and it, the whole thing was weird is that I, i'm wondering now is that what the poultry guys did to andrew lloyd Webber? no the the reports are that andrew lloyd Webber just found his books organized in another room by something that hadn't been exercised by him like he just he saw a bunch of papers and everything organized and no one had done it for him and he thought a poultry guys did it is it possible there was a, a maid service arranged for him that he did not know about? <laughs> it, it's a more uh, common sense explanation than the one he's choosing. Did he I, move out of his house or something because of it or just ex excised no, it? No, it, it left. And then I thought about it and I was like, all of his musicals are just about like main character horny, like phantom, horny phantom, cats, horny cats. Yeah. That's basically every musical. What is this? Breaking we have news? Breaking news from Variety. John Stewart is to return to The Daily Show as executive producer and Monday night host. Correspondents will handle duties Tuesday through Thursday. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, we saw that Apple, uh, he and Apple had political differences, and John Stewart's an important voice in America, and he needs a platform. Roy Wood Jr. the other day was. Uh, in the background, mouthing, hire a host, hire a host. It's an important show. It's an especially important show this election period. And John Stewart lending his voice to today's politics as a guy, and I've told you this before, voted America's most trusted newsman over all the anchors when he was hosting The Daily Show. He usurped Brian Williams. Anyone who's got problems with the truth of media, this guy is at the forefront of being a comedian that people trust. If he runs for office, people would vote for him. He does a lot of work on good causes on the right side of history that no one would argue with on getting first responders and military uh, soldiers some health. So any, any platform that allows Jon Stewart to influence America with his voice and credibility would be welcome because he is not just credible as a comedian. He's credible as someone who fights for the right side of things. He actually was voted the most trustworthy yes, news source. Yes, by, by polling, uh, polling indicated of America as the uh, trust in American media faded. Uh, he, it was uh, polling by Time magazine. He, uh, he became uh, the, the most trusted news source because he was doing a political show as comedy. We've seen around here, right? One of the things I do wrong all the time, the best way to attack this stuff is not sermonizing and screed. The best way to attack it is by satire. It's by welcoming people into the fun and pointing out hypocrisy. And over years, that show did it better than anybody. They were groundbreaking and pioneering because of that man. And then, for those of you who weren't paying attention, and this part's important because it's offensive if you care about real free speech and media doing its job. John Stewart was doing things for Apple that were too hot for Apple, even though it was just truth, truth, fact, fact, truth, truth. And Apple ran him off because the corporations are taking over everything and they want their news to appeal to everyone because Republicans buy news, too. And not, not quite, too, because Apple was um, in a very tricky position, given their corporate partnerships, where they make their, where they manufacture their goods, um, artificial intelligence conversations put them in a difficult spot. It wasn't necessarily, in terms of like Apple TV consumers and where they reside on the aisle, that probably didn't make the metal stand. You know what? Forgive me. You're absolutely right about this. But where it comes to corporate conflict, and you want your media to not be compromised by capitalism, just do it that way. Because you're right. 
It's probably not on the list of things that Apple objected to, whatever. I think he was, I think the reason his show was gone is something to do with China. I, I'm, I'm not sure of the details. I don't know that he's talked about this yet. I've been waiting to hear from him on what happened. But what he was doing on the Apple platform was more thorough and comprehensive and researched than anything that was happening in television anywhere. He was tackling subject matter that none of the other shows, not John, not John Oliver, not Colbert, not any of his disciples, they were not tackling what he was tackling in long form, hugely researched, and it wasn't just politics, it was the economy, it was leadership distorting the difference between haves and have-nots. That show was brilliant and not a lot of people were seeing it because it was behind a paywall and he couldn't make it work with Apple because Apple has corporate compromises that it has to make that Jon Stewart is not willing to make. Starlight Express, horny trains. Phantom of the Opera was horny. You, you really think, every you musical think John is horny. Stewart Dan. knows every animal's blood. Put it on the poll. Is every musical horny? Put it on the yeah. poll. Uh, <laughs> yes. And put it on the poll as well. Did Jessica yeah. just horny explain to Dan? Because I fell asleep during Phantom of the Opera. F physically fell asleep uh, while watching it. As so opposed I, to <laughs> metaphorically. Well, I'm not saying it. Yes, I'm not saying it is something. What was your that, blood sleeping? <laughs> It's time for Against the Spread. It's presented by DraftKings Fantasy Sports. Check out what DraftKings has to offer this season with code DAN, because life's more fun when you're in on the action. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Greg Cody, welcome to Against the Spread. We just told him we were going to do this, and he's like, what's that? And I thought it was self-explanatory, uh, but it is not. Do you no. understand the game, Greg? I do. I got it down. This is your maiden voyage on is. Against the Spread. And uh, Happy to be here. We'd like for you to kick things off. Lions plus seven. Against, against the spread. So you like them to keep it close, yes. uh, like Jamel Hill. Uh, I am going to go with a basketball game, the worst basketball game played this season. Oh. Charlotte is at Detroit. No, I want that one. Detroit oh, is a favorite. The I'm, four. Who are we taking, Dan? The four and, and 39 Pistons are a three-point favorite. We should be celebrating that. Wow. Uh, because Charlotte no longer has Terry Rozier, and uh, he swings the line that way. I'm going to take the Pistons to cover. To same. Win, to win and cover. I want. I was. I swear, usually we like to do our own thing around here, but I wanted that exact same thing. Wow. I'm riding with Dan. I Pistons. mean, come on. The Pistons, minus two and a half. So, but, but you. Again. Yes. The spread. Thank you. I guess we'll go right next to Jess. That's you, big Jeremy. one, yeah, big one coming up in college basketball. No, he meant basketball we'll go tonight. next, yeah, yeah next to, to Jess. Jess. Oh, I was, I that's why I was confused. Me, he said like, right next, Jeremy. to right next. Yeah. To Jess. I heard it the way Mike said it. Uh, yeah, no, Jess is up. I could have said it better, guys, but Jeremy, you're up. <laughs> big one in college hoops tonight. James Madison taking on Old Dominion. I'm gonna take Old Dominion plus seven and a half. Again, okay. okay. All right, we're gonna go right next to Jeremy. <laughs> any particular reason that you're picking that, Jeremy? Any any analysis? Any anything? No. No, no, no reason. No. Game of the week. Analytics. Next to Jessica. Next to Analytics. Jeremy. Yeah. Jessica, what do you got? A little U.S. Open rematch action. Coco Goff and Arena Sebalenka. And I'm taking Coco Goff Woo. plus 180. Against money line. I don't think that's money line. That's not against the spread. Old Dominion that's does have spreads. experience. I asked Mike if I could pick yeah, Tennis can. Money Line she before we against started. That's not against the spread. Hey, it's, it's that's a different he game. It's money fine. line. You also took a money line bet. It's a different game. You also took no, a money I did line. not. Yeah, you're it's like, I'm going to take it. No, win and, and cover. Win and cover. Yeah, well, the same. Against the spread. Okay. Charlotte. That's not against the spread. Charlotte. That's money. Now. Charlotte. Uh, yes, I, I took an am under once. Taking the Minnesota Timberwolves uh, tonight to beat the Washington Wizards. <laughs> this is one of the best teams in the league. One of the to worst. To beat teams them in or the to league. cover? Because beat them is the money line against the spread. They're, to they're cover. Mine is eleven. 11. To cover. Yeah. 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 Ye
bad at this, Dave. Oh. You did fine, Charlotte. Spread, spread, the spread, rules spread. are getting a little muddy, Mike. Let's I'm, go next to Charlotte. I'm taking the Niners <laughs> <laughs> against the spread. So you're going against opposite to yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And you know what? I'm making this a two-unit play. Wow. That's Niners what you mean, could a lose outright. Play. What do you mean a two-unit play? It's I mean, it's gambling against terms. The spread or two it's units. Not against the What's your unit? It's What's your unit look Let like? Let me see. A thumb. Hmm. Mine's $50. That tracks. What's a unit? Your standard betting unit. It, it changes depending on PP. who it is. <laughs> like Because uh, like, everyone gambles when differently. You have a nor- oh, I get it, when you I have get a it, normal it. feeling on the game, what's your standard bet? Oh, I don't That's know. a unit. Okay. Well, uni? Stephen A. Smith says that he wants to debate Donald Trump. Against the spread. That... Uh, he would eat him alive, Stephen A. Smith says. Uh, he, he has also said in the past uh, he doesn't want to run for president, but he could do it. <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> it just sounds like Stephen A. Smith. I would watch that debate. I would pay per view to watch it. That's how much I would look forward to that. I, I think Stephen A. Smith in a debate against anybody would be interesting. It's basically what he does on television every day. But to watch him debate Trump? I think would be genuinely entertaining. Trump on first take would be a thing. It would be great. Entertaining. Would it? Would it? Yeah. Because I, the, the Republican debates have not been that. Uh, well, they also haven't had Trump no, in them. No, the last time he partook in well, them. Well, they're they, embarrassing, they, but they're kind of entertaining. No. Yes. I know that's not, terrible not to say. The last, but, not uh, the last batch of them. I wouldn't say that they where were. Where he just starts like, <laughs> where he, he respo- like they, someone says something to him and his response is like, you're a liar. I mean, okay. <laughs> I mean, that is first take, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the certainly the future of sports argument television. Yeah. You're a liar is a great name for a sports debate show. <laughs> is this just his response to Aaron Rodgers challenging Fauci? He's like, now I have to challenge yeah, someone to a debate. I'm like, oh, can I, we're can all I, doing this now. Can I just be honest with the group right now? I still haven't been able to shake Poppy's ear. Oh. <laughs> I, uh, I looked inside the belly of the beast. And I didn't need the Irify camera to, to pull out. In fact, the Irify camera was getting in the way of what I felt was now a, a, a health crisis on my hands that I needed to extract this. And I only took half of it, by the way. The other yeah. half is still not even launched. I it's just like floating, it suspended. Like we don't got to relive it, video like, team. Thank the you. most oh, of it was my. still buried deep in there. We could only see the tip. Yeah, you could see the tip right there. That little shiny thing on the on the bottom right of the ear. Fry. <laughs> there is so much more in there. Dude, <laughs> your dad needs to go someplace. I felt so bad screaming about how disgusting it was while he was sitting right here, by the way. Like, yeah. that was the, that was the meanest I think I felt all week. It made me feel better about my dad's ears. I thought my ears were horrific. No, your ears no, are you great. Came off looking great. Great me. day for Greg's And nowhere ears. near as hairy. I'm gonna. Oh. when I get home, I'm gonna d- take whatever I have in my oh, bathroom. Stop video, video, please. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna blow dry my ears. I'm gonna do something with what? it. I don't know what. what. That probably won't help. What do you mean I you're mean, gonna blow dry your to ears? To melt the wax? Is that what you were thinking? Yes. Yes. To melt the wax? I I'm will take. You. I'll take a flamethrower to my ears to get rid of no, all that. But hair. just out of curiosity, you believe that you can go in with a blow dryer and it's, do something to what was happening inside your ears? It's better than nothing. <laughs> It's better than nothing. It is not. Uh, put it on the poll, please, Juju. Can you get out air earwax with a blow dryer? I think no, so. You, the, you're not supposed to do the heat stuff, Greg. I'm, no? I'm sorry. I think you're you you're supposed to go to a professional. I How think. about a leaf blower? In, yes. In rewatching okay. the video, I barely got 10 percent of what's lodged in your dad's uh, ear. Mike, I does barely it got any of it. Gross you out doing this to yourself, or was it particularly? Well, gross? honestly, I'm a little bit disappointed in myself in going inside of greg's ear especially and and dan's dad's ear i found out that that my ears are hairier than (laughs) theirs well this is i just started having a deep-seated resentment for my grandfather at this point from sicily uh, if i may i'm going to take people back to yesterday you have to understand Mike Ryan introduced us to this instrument and said it doesn't work correctly. All it got in my ear was caught in a thicket that didn't go anywhere. In the cases of Greg and my father, that camera worked just fine. That instrument works just fine. It got deep in there, but with Mike, it never got through the shrubbery. It never got to some gold, golden disgust. It just got stuck in, in Ancestor's hair. Right, right. No, I, I, I understand all that, but but it's still is it still gross? 
It's not as great. Everyone loves their own brand. The, not on that, this one. You know, everyone loves no, their own brand. Uh, no, an ear. This labyrinth is disgusting for most men. I'm telling you, Dan. There's no part of of my brand I don't like. In rewatching that video, there is huh? so much more meat left on that bone that is stuck in your dad's ear. You want to? You want to take that back? <laughs> no, I stand by it. You stand by. I love my brand on all counts. Tom Wham's gams over here. <laughs> look, look, every look, inch. Look, there is so much in there. I barely got any of it. Oh, it's so gross. I just this the random long black hair in Greg's ear was kind of interesting. Yeah, terrible. Where did that? Yeah, that I don't think that's native to your ear, Greg. I think I, that's an eyelash from someone else's eye. You know what? It could have been. I'm all that. They're like I'm all Brundlefly wires in there. <laughs> um, you say it's an eyelash. That was an electrical cord. That was a wire of some sort of a different color. I will say this, though. When you guys say that you're disgusted, I am disgusted by myself. I don't believe I have ever more unfairly, without warning, exploited my father. And I, I agree. That was elder abuse. It was rough. You're going to win the footy next year for elder abuse. That was unfair what it is that I just did to my father, where he came in today to eat pastelitos and with no warning. We didn't intend to do that. It just sort of sprung from the sewage of what it is that we do every day. And while it was happening, I'm like, man, my father's being a good sport about this, but this is an uncool thing I've just put my father in front of because we're doing much of this impromptu. It makes sense now why we get from Poppy so many, huh? Yeah. yeah. That he had... Uh, <laughs> Why? Because he has trouble hearing. Does your does your wax affect hearing? Put it on the pole, please. Yeah, I feel like it should. It, At it Levitard should, but show. I, yeah, it does. okay. I mean, let's think scientifically about this. One would seem uh, common sense would indicate as such, but I don't think it's an uh, invalid question. Doesn't it feel like one of those things though that you're like, well, surely earwax impacts hearing, and then a doctor's like, actually, no, it doesn't have any effect on it. That's why I asked. I'm Dan. I only know about blood, not ears. Shar, <laughs> <laughs> sure, you should debate Fauci. <laughs> Uh, Chris Cody, I like this character. It just, <laughs> man, Dan the know it all. Oh, it leads with, oh, I'm Dan. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed it's limited, yeah. but but people will enjoy that character. Uh, put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Lebetard Show. Does earwax really and actually affect anyone's hearing? Thank you, Dan. <laughs> huh? <laughs> 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 